Hey, it's another day, I think. Probably another day. So I got this little guy right here. Fancy, expensive little piece of machined uh, brass or bronze or whatever. Some sort of gold metal looking stuff. Yellow metal, I don't know. This has uh, an extended neck, O-ring seal, and hopefully this will screw onto this. We'll find out, haven't done it yet. That looks pretty good, O-ring, O-ring. So we'll go ahead and tighten that down to smash that rubber together. And now hopefully this will thread into the head. That's the important part. Now this doesn't have any kind of check valves or anything like that in it, so I can't stick it on, well, I can. I shouldn't stick it onto the air hose just yet because it'll just start shooting air out and that'll be a pain in the butt. One thing that's important next, after I have screwed that in, is if you have been using a wrench of some sort to turn the crank bolt in order to get the cam where you want it to be before removing the rockers, that was a step we did earlier, you want to make sure you take that wrench off of there. In fact, if you work in a shop, you probably already know this. You never leave a wrench on a crank bolt or anything else that's going to spin because if you hit that starter or if anything else happens that starts the engine, that wrench is going to fly around in there and violently, real violently, like break your arm, make a real expensive mess under the hood kind of stuff. So uh, whenever you're going to, to do anything involving turning the crank with a wrench, when you're finished, you take the wrench off of it just as a precaution, just as good practices. And also kind of like if you're handling firearms, pretend it's always loaded, you know, don't point it at anyone even when you're cleaning it, whatever. Uh, similar to this, it makes such a big mess. I haven't personally done it. I've seen the aftermath. It can make a big mess. So just check, double check, always triple check. Anyway, let's see if this threads in. I really hope it does. I'm gonna feel good if it does. I don't know the correct angle. All right, that looks like it threaded in. So now the engine is probably going to push down. It may do so violently when I plug the hose into it. It may not do it violently. It kind of depends on where in the stroke the piston is. If the piston's right up near the top, it can build up some pretty good speed. If it's near the bottom already or at the bottom, it's just gonna sit there and be undramatic. So let's plug it in. That was pretty undramatic. So right now you may or may not hear air is hissing in there. The piston doesn't form a perfect seal on the rings. It doesn't have to. That's, that's kind of what compression is about or when you do a compression check. There's going to be some leak down or some blow by. Now in the speed that the piston is being blown down by a combustion event, it doesn't have time to really leak down much. Just, it, it's blowing down so hard that there's just not time for much leakage to occur. But when you have an air hose just feeding air down there and there's no film of oil or you know, the, the dynamics of combustion taking place, yeah, the air is gonna leak past all the rings into the crankcase from the combustion chamber. So what that means is that for you, you're gonna see a montage of me fooling around, probably because the compressor is gonna kick on in a second as it has to continuously feed air. You have to make sure that your compressor is able to keep up with this. Pretty much any like compressor that actually has an air reservoir tank is probably going to be plenty for this. I've got a 25 gallon. Uh, it's a one and a half horsepower, 20 gallon, 1.5 horsepower, whatever. I've got that thing sitting over there. And so it's enough for this generally. If it's not enough, it's because you've got a real leaky cylinder. and Maybe you've got some deeper engine problems than just this. Uh, so this should work just fine. The compressor is going to run probably 50% duty cycle while I do this. That's at least been my experience. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and see if this little uh, valve spring compressor works. I was going to use the, the uh, valve spring compressor that I have for my small block Ford because I thought the spacing would be the same. Apparently the spacing is not the same between the pedestals on them. So I can't get that one to bolt down because the pedestal spacing is different. Okay, so I bought this just generic, cheap, universal overhead valve, valve spring compressor. It doesn't look very good, but it really only has to work this one time. I hope it works well. So let's see if this thing works. You're probably not going to hear me talking for a little while because any minute now that compressor is going to kick on and it's a lot louder than I am.
right, well, this is time to make a very good point, I think. So I have this tool right here from Comp Cams, and this tool is made for small block Chevy and small block Ford. And I can't use this on this engine. I thought I could, but the spacing on these holes is not the same as the spacing between the valves on this, which is a shame because this tool works extremely well. Uh, it uses this little kind of H-shaped brace push down on two valve springs at the same time. It's extremely positive and extremely confident. It, it works exceedingly well. And I bought it for work on my other engine, on my small block Ford. Worked perfectly for that, excellent. Uh, but I discovered in the middle of this process that it would not fit this engine. So, okay, uh, you know, that's how it goes. Uh, and basically I couldn't find like a equivalent for this engine so I thought, okay, I'll buy the $20 one at AutoZone, uh, the little universal overhead valve guy for this. And that's what's in there right now. Uh, that one grabs somewhere along the valve spring, <laughs> um, but it can't grab the bottom of the valve spring because the bottom is up against the head. It can't grab the first coil or two because the first coil or two are flat to each other. That That's just the shape of the spring that the first, like, coil and a half is stacked already just just by the nature of the spring so that means I have to grab like midway up the spring which means So as you can see, I can realistically only grab part of and smash down part of the coil spring. That's terrifying. And I've also got these little tiny keepers that I have to try and get out, which is not easy. It's best if you have a magnetic tool, and it's also best if your engine is not oriented in such a way that there are drain back holes where these can fall down into the engine, because if they fall down into the bottom of the engine, you're dropping the pan to get them back out, or you're buying new keepers and just letting them live down there for all eternity, which isn't ideal. I guess they wouldn't really get in too much trouble, but it's not good, you know? So the next part is use some special pliers to pull up the old valve guide seal. So here's the old valve guide seal. Here's the little collar spring that goes around it. That collar spring is meant to just hold tension continuously on the rubber collar. And that way, even if the rubber kind of gets like molded or smashed into a shape where it's not holding tension around the valve stem, the rubber is supposed to kind of still pull it in. Now, if this little spring gets like hard varnish, gack stuff between all its coils, and those are keeping it from, you know, tensioning it down, then sometimes by washing out the oil, using an engine flush of some sort, or using some kind of a solvent cleaner, Marvel, whatever, uh, in there, or even just repeatedly changing the oil, you know, on a proper schedule with fresh oil can clean that out and then cause some of your smoking to go away. However, if the valve guide seals are hard, like this is hard as a rock right now, like I'm squeezing on it really tightly and it, it's really firm rubber. Uh, if it's really firm, oil's just gonna go past it. It's no longer really serving as any kind of a seal. It's just, you know, it's just a channel that oil drops through. So these I can tell just by feeling how hard the rubber is, like how plasticized it is. That's where our smoke's coming from. Uh, I'm pretty confident about that at this point. I was confident already just because of the nature of how and when it's smoked. I, I've been down this road before, but seeing these, yeah, like this is for sure where the, where the smoke is coming from. So uh, I'm pretty confident on that, which means Fix is gonna fix it. This guy here goes bye-bye. So you can see here with the valve spring removed, now the valve stem is just sticking up and the only thing holding it up is the air pressure inside the cylinder. So if I were to push that down, which I don't want to do, but if I were to push that down, then air would be able to leak out of the cylinder, probably back up through here. You'd see this wad of paper towel shoot a foot in the sky and you'd see the valve drop down and you would hear me scream a bunch of obscenities because that would mean I'd have to remove the head to retrieve that because there's no other way to get it out of there. Since it's at an angle to the piston, if I were to just turn the piston up, you know, by slowly cranking the engine around, 
chances are real good the stem wouldn't come up high enough for me to be able to push it because it would kind of bind against the edge of the valve guide. So bad day for everybody if that were to drop in, which is why I don't want that to happen, uh, which is why we've got this air hose here. And so the next thing that I get to do from here is I get to put a new seal on there because I took the old seal off. All right, the next part of this process is gonna seem kind of complicated. It's just a bunch of little steps, uh, but it is a good idea to do them right. Assembly grease, the new valve stem seal. Sometimes there's a different one for the exhaust ports versus the intake ports. In this case, they're all the same. This little guy here, the job of this is to protect the seal from the sharp edges of the top of the valve where, the, uh, where those little retainers live. So this guy here is important. And don't forget this on top of the valve when you reassemble it. It's possible to do that. It's dumb to do that. Don't do that. This guy, this is for transferring the seal. It's actually kind of important. This guy is for seating the seal. And this guy is for going like that. And she's seated. So for the benefit of the camera, it took a little bit longer because I had to make sure that it was hopefully visible to you, sort of what I was doing. Sorry, I don't have a close-up, but maybe I'll try to get a close-up for the next one. So it's pretty quick. There's really not a lot to it. As I mentioned, don't forget to retain this thing. First of all, you only get like one or two of them with the new seals. Second, even though it probably won't hurt anything for it to be jammed in there, it's gonna live there the rest of the life of the engine, which is just weird to have a little plastic straw doodad living in your engine, kind of in a weird place. Uh, probably won't ever cause harm, except if someone else ever gets in there, they're gonna be like, ah, that jackass. Uh, but anyway, pretty easy process. Now I get to put the spring back on, which is terrifying, and then I get to work on the next one. This part's only terrifying because of that crappy tool. I wish I could use the proper tool. Uh, if you do know of a proper tool for this engine, uh, well, I won't probably need it because I'm not doing this engine again, I, I don't think. Uh, but I may need it for that engine. That car's got a 3.8 in it, and there may come a day when I get to do that job on that car. And also, of course, for the benefit of anyone else watching this video, if you know of a really, really, really good, really good tool at any price for this specific job of taking the valve, of compressing the valve springs for this engine, that would be cool. Post it down below, please. Well, I gave it a little bath, not a super great bath. I don't actually have a big tub of solvent on hand. I would love to just give these guys a really good bath, but it's all right. Uh, it's a little bit cleaner than it was. You know, got the, the gacky gack out of there. And, a... and since this car is now going to be treated to proper oil changes at a proper interval, the rest of this will clean itself up, I think. Well, that's the first one done, and I gotta say, I hate this tool. I can do the rest of this job with this tool. It is possible, uh, it's, it functions, but when I was first doing a valve stem seal job on a Mitsubishi engine, it was the first time I'd ever done valve stem seals, and I asked around on the internet what the best tool for that job was, and I got a lot of people telling me some real frontier medicine kind of stuff, you know, like, oh, just stuff a bunch of cotton rope down inside the cylinder and turn the crank until the piston holds the valves up and then stick a socket over the end of it and just hit it with a hammer and pray that you don't lose any of your little keepers, you know, and then they just fall down into the crankcase and everything. That's, no, I mean, that's terrible. And so there are a number of various different tools that can be used for that job. I ended up buying the $400 Mitsubishi tool, like the really real $400 Mitsubishi tool for that. And so I did mine, I did my brother-in-law's, and then I also gave the tool, well, I traded in kind, uh, with Adventure Driven Design so that they would have the Mitsubishi tool on hand for any of their future Mitsubishi stuff, which is awesome for them, awesome for me, because I got to do the job with pleasure, as close to with pleasure as can be thought of in doing a kind of weird job like this. Uh, but the reason I bought that $400 tool and don't feel bad about it is because the tool freaking works. 
You can work calmly. There's no question about it slipping off. There's no like just barely being on the precipice of failure. You've got all the time in the world to just work calmly in a, in a, in a procedure that functions. And this is not that. This grabs the spring partway down as you saw. You kind of barely have to get it in there and then rock it back and forth to let the keepers out because it doesn't compress the spring far enough to just get direct access to the keepers. So you have to kind of rock it to let them out. And then the keepers, they want to slip and fall and, you know, to perhaps fall down into the crankcase or fall onto the ground or fall into wherever all those 10 millimeter sockets go. And then what? Like, I don't have any spare keepers, so then I have to wait to get more keepers, which, yeah, they're available, but that all sucks. Uh, this is just not a great tool to use. Um, and then the, the hit it with a socket trick that people talk about. No. And then uh, there's a tool by Lyle that's kind of like an elaborate hit it with a socket, but it has magnets inside of it that are supposed to catch the keepers. But I've seen that be used and it doesn't really work every time. So you spend 10 or 15 different events of trying to make it work. Some of which times when you hit it with the hammer to get it to unlock, it also pushes the valve down. And so if it pushes the valve down and your air pressure leaks out and then your keepers fall off, then you've just, now you have to take the head off. Like, terrible. So I'm gonna research exactly what the right tool is for this job. And if it's 100 bucks, I'll go order it. If it's 150 bucks, I'll go order it. Uh, because I'd rather do this job properly. And in addition to this engine, at some point I'm probably gonna have to do my wife's car and that's got the same engine in it. So I'll need the same tool for that. And then I may end up do it, doing this job for friends or something like that in the future because I know other people with Mustangs. And so I want to have the right tool for that job. Uh, yeah, I could do the rest of the job with this and I could do my wife's with this. I, I could use this thing for a hundred of this job if I hated myself an awful lot, uh, but I don't. So I'm gonna go find the right tool. So I got the first one done using this tool here, which I gotta say is not optimal. It, it did work. Obviously, I got the first one done. The problems with this are a couple of things. First, th these little guys here have to grab the bottom of the spring, but they can't actually grab the bottom of the spring because that's pressed up against the head. So they have to grab somewhere along the spring. And these springs don't have a lot of coils. They're, you know, they're not a foot long. They're, they're little short guys, so they only have a couple of coils. And so you can really only grab you know, one, one or two coils up from the bottom where it actually spreads out because the first kind of coil and a half is stacked already. So you only really get to grab the first half of it and then you have to compress all the way down with the first half. It doesn't really leave a lot of room to get the keepers. And then once it's out, once the spring is out, you're kind of at the mercy of leaving it in this tool, which means that you can't clean it. I'm not really sure how you would go about grabbing a fresh coil if you were replacing this, the coil springs with new ones or higher performance ones or something like that. Because you'd have to predict where you can grab them from and, and grab them from those specific coils. So yeah, this is far below optimal. Now I found the, the official Ford Rotunda tool. I don't recall the part number because it's like E61B-4564, whatever, you know, some ridiculous long thing. I found that because I have a uh, factory service manual for 94 Mustangs and this engine was already in that so it lists all of the official Ford Rotunda tools. So I found that tool, it's $379, which is a lot. Uh, I did find a used one on eBay for 95, cool, and that's still a possibility. But upon looking at what it actually is, it ain't much. Like it really isn't much of a tool. So I'm gonna try my hand at making one uh, at home here. And if the one I make here at home works correctly, I, I got the parts sitting around here already. If I have to purchase one you know, from eBay or from wherever to, to get the right tool, okay, then I'll spend the money. But let's try to make one at home first. In addition to abusing a 5 8 inch uh, inexpensive wrench, I also abused a couple of drill bits, which are now in hell. Uh, probably hanging out with my dad, who didn't teach me how to use tools properly. But I got this thing here, and uh, so you can see pretty much what it is. It's a stubby little wrench. The reason it's got this hole, you'll see in a minute. The reason it's got this little cutoff part here is just to clear stuff. I, I don't need this part of the wrench, and it would be in the way of some stuff. 
so it had to go away. That part was pretty easy. Friction disc cut it off. This part, since it's forged, it's a bit hard, and then my dumbass went in a little bit too dry, got it too hot, and heat treated it. And I'm not like I'm not a metal guy. I, I actually wish I knew more about it than I do, but I think that means I made the tool harder there from the heat and pressure, and then made it harder to drill. So yeah, that, that was bad on me. I, I really screwed up there. But I completed it, I threw away the drill bits, such is life. Still cheaper than spending the money on the real tool, so if this works, it's worth it. And I got some brand new drill bits out of the deal. So uh, let's go ahead and get to work. So, a uh, janky tool that costs $22 and is terrifying and I hate it. Janky tool that is made out of this stuff, uh, I don't know, probably 8 or $9 worth of stuff. Uh, it's terrible and I hate it. They're terrible and I hate them. So, the hard part of this is that the Rotunda tool, the Ford Rotunda tool, Rotunda is the like house brand for tools that are made for Ford specifically. Uh, that's why I keep referring to that name. The Rotunda tool isn't much better than this. It's like this with a lever on it. And that's kind of why I looked at this and that and thought, well, I'll just make my own because the one from Rotunda kind of doesn't look all that awesome. You know, if the one that they want to sell for almost $400 MSRP looked like a serious piece of hardware or some precisely engineered thing, I would be like, oh, there's, yeah, there's like almost 400 bucks worth of value there. But it really is just like a, a fork and a lever that you kind of use like this, except instead of turning a, a nut, you, you pull on a lever. And it looks kind of crappy, honestly. It doesn't look all that great. So that's why I thought I could just make my own. And, um, Lesson learned, I think if I used a three quarter inch instead of a five eighths inch as my sacrifice, there'd be a lot more meat in this area here because I'm, I'm really asking an awful lot of that little bit of metal there. And so that's making it bend a little bit under use. And uh, it may not have a lot of bends in it. And when it lets go, there's a lot of energy there. I've been wearing goggles because I don't want to lose my eyes, but you know, it's, it's also I could lose, I could be in pain. You know? <laughs> Uh, so the pain part is crappy and I could also lose like the little keepers which might be even worse than being in pain because that's like parts I need for, for the car to go together. So, uh, lesson learned on this. Yeah, it works. Totally works. I would use a three-quarter to start with so it would be a little bit fatter in the neck area here. 
uh, and and that'll certainly do it. And I actually think, barring that bending issue, this is better than this. This is horrible. This at least pushes the spring down and you can push the whole spring down pretty easily. So this is still better, I think. But uh, I'm gonna regroup and see about option number three now.